I'm afraid to say thank you because then you might think that I thought the applause was for me. I'm not that foolish. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter Mead. I have the great honor to be the chair of the Board of Trustees of Emerson College. We are here this afternoon in the Cutler Majestic Theater, named for our dear friends Teddy and Joan Cutler. And for those uh, of us who have had the honor to be friends of both Teddy and Joni, today is one of those remarkably, awfully sad days. Uh, Joan passed away this weekend. Her funeral service was just this morning. And for those who didn't know Joni, as you come into this theater, it ought to be a reminder of those people amongst us who have done well and want to share with us. And if you didn't know her or for those of us who did, coming to this theater is a reminder of how wonderful a human being Joan, Joan was. If you didn't know Joan and you walked down the Commonwealth Avenue Mall during the winter season, the trees are lit. Teddy and Joan did that. If you drive on the Southeast Expressway and see this incredible building that is the Boston Food Bank, Teddy and Joan did that. And for so many of us, Teddy and Joan have touched our lives. If, like me, you're blessed to be in a loving relationship with your partner or spouse, Teddy and Joan are there. And so I would ask you to share a moment with me and ask you to stand and participate in a moment of silence for our dear friend, Joan Cutler. Thank you very much. More than 500 years ago today in Florence, Michelangelo unveiled for the first time the incredible work, David. And people are going to see that statue this very day. 50 years ago today, the junior senator from Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy, in a struggling run for the presidency, spoke in Texas. And he spoke about an America that didn't judge people by where they went to church or whether they went to church or temple or synagogue. He talked about a freedom in America to be who we might be. David is remembered centuries later. John F. Kennedy's call to greatness in America is remembered decades later. And it's a reminder to us who are part of the Emerson community that while the headlines today may not be about art or culture or communications, what is remembered is what we do. And it's why we as a community took so seriously the search for the person to replace Jackie. There are board members who are here. I see the vice chair, Larry Rasky, Marilyn Zacharis, uh, Barbara Rutberg, who is um, uh, the administration person, uh, Jerry Lanson, Greg, Maureen Shea from the faculty. There were uh, Adriana uh, from students, uh, two members of the uh, Board of Overseers, Colette Phillips and Denise Kegler. Uh, and people took the work seriously. And the committee worked so well together. Vinda Bona, the other vice chair of the board, at the end of our work, where the committee voted unanimously for a person you're about to hear from, Vin said, not only was this great work, but we've all become friends. And it was a remarkable moment of Emerson working together for a great goal. I'm proud to have been a member of that committee and salute the people who were such an important part of it and did extraordinary work. Now, one of the reasons the job was so hard was we are, at the end of this academic year, about to say farewell to an extraordinary person, 
I have said before, the most important person to cross the threshold at Emerson College in its history is our president, Jackie Liebergott. She has helped transform this school into the clear winner of any school that deals with communications and the communications art. We are an extraordinary community in a great position to even improve ourselves, and Lee will speak about that. But the woman who has led this school so well, who is our friend and leader, the president of Emerson College, Jacqueline Weiss Liebergott. Jackie? Thank you, Peter. You know, when I think back about becoming president of Emerson College in 1993, after serving for many years as a faculty member and an academic administrator, I'm reminded of an oft-quoted line from a Robert Frost po uh, poem, The Road Not Taken. It says, two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The road we took led from the Back Bay to the Theater District, which was then known as the Combat Zone. Instead of moving to the suburban community of Lawrence, as a predecessor of mine sought to do, this decision has made a world of difference. It has given us a vibrant present and future instead of almost a slow death. Thanks to the vision I shared with successive leaders of the Board of Trustees, and thanks to the skill and tenacity of a guy named Rob Silverman, we bro bravely took the road less traveled by and thanks to all of your hard work and support, we have succeeded against all odds and beyond any reasonable expectation. While remaining true to our 130-year-old mission, we have reinvented Emerson, enhanced its visibility, stature, and quality, and reinvigorated the theater district in the process. I couldn't have done it without you. And I will be forever indebted to you for all that you have done to help us create the new Emerson College. But, or and, there comes a time when change is good for institutions and for individuals although it can also be accompanied by risk. Last December, I announced I would step down and make room for new leadership to build on the progress we have made and take Emerson to new and greater heights. The Board of Trustees has conducted an extensive national search for our next president, and I'm pleased to say they have succeeded magnificently in their mission. They have selected a new president who has the experience, the skills, and the vision to take Emerson to even greater heights. His name is Lee Pelton. He comes to Emerson with a doctoral degree from Harvard and an impressive track record of accomplishment as a teacher and administrator at that university as the undergraduate dean at both Cornell and Dartmouth, and as the president for the past 12 years of Willamette University in Oregon. He is also the father of a, a lovely young woman named Claire, who's there. 
who enrolled as a junior this year, or should I say, re-enrolled as a junior this year, as Lee is actually an Emerson parent. Lee is active in several educational and cultural organizations and has written extensively on higher education, diversity, and the liberal arts. As I come to know him, it is clear to me that he also has an instinctive appreciation for the importance of the work we do in communication and in the arts, and for the need to ground the study of these fields in a liberal arts perspective. The poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, wrote, great is the art of beginning, but greater is the art of ending. As I prepare to end my term as president and pass the mantle of leadership to the new president, I'm filled with mixed emotions. I love Emerson and will miss the challenge and satisfaction of being at the helm. But I am comforted and very excited by the appointment of Lee Pelton as president. It's hard to imagine a better leader to build on the progress we have made and propel Emerson to the next level of achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our next president, Dr. Lee Pelton. Well, Jackie, thank you for that very kind and generous introduction. It is a great privilege for me to be here today in this magnificent setting, and I am deeply honored to accept the Board of Trustees' offer to serve as Emerson's next president. As once was recently and famously said, you can have only one president at a time. Obviously true. Nevertheless, Jackie and I have agreed to work together during the course of this academic year to develop a transition plan that will have the best chance of ensuring that when the baton is passed next summer, the college will not miss a stride. And Jackie, to you, I want to say that having myself served as a college president for a dozen years, I know and I am sympathetic to how difficult it is to leave behind an institution in which one has made such an emotional commitment for such a long period of time. It requires focus and tenacity and fortitude, not to mention plenty of sleepless nights. And I pledge to you that I will honor your legacy by sustaining and building upon the very good work that you have done in your many years of service on behalf of Emerson College. Your inspired leadership has transformed Emerson and most recently substantively revitalized Boston arts and culture through the creation of a new campus. And you did this by nurturing a strategic partnership with Boston's mayor, who, by the way, is a great supporter of you and of the college in moving, as we all know, from the Back Bay to the Theater District, greatly enhancing facilities, reorganizing and strengthening academic programs, doubling the size of the full-time faculty, and selectively strengthening the enrollment profile. But perhaps most important, you have strengthened Emerson's capacity for wonder and learning enhanced its national visibility and reputation and instilled into this community a sense of unceasing hope and optimism, much as is expressed in Keats' beautiful lyrical poem, Ode to Autumn, to swell the gourd 
and plump the hazel shells, with a sweet kernel to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease. So thank you for creating in this place and this time an unending summer for all of us to enjoy. And I know that the faculty, the students, the staff, the friends and trustees who are gathered here this morning are also very grateful and want to thank you for your support. Thank you, Jackie. My acquaintance with Emerson dates back more than three decades ago when I studied, taught, and lived on the other side of the Charles River. Emerson's former, more modest location in the Back Bay is still fresh in my memory of it. But imagine my surprise when, having been informed by my daughter in her sophomore year in high school that she wanted to attend Emerson, I discovered that it had picked up, packed up, and moved to the theater district creating this wonderful new campus of which we are the happy beneficiaries. Now, mind you, my daughter made it clear that she was not seeking my advice on this very important decision, for she had already made up her mind that she wanted to go to Emerson and no other place. And in fact, if left to her own devices, she would have applied only to Emerson, save for a worried father who prudently coaxed her to apply to other, shall we say, less worthy colleges. <laughs> so today, I stand here as that extreme representative example of that thing which college and university presidents most dread and loathe, the helicopter parent. <laughs> one, who, one who not only hovers noisily above presidential offices, but actually, in my case, moves to college with his firstborn child. <laughs> and to make matters worse, I have done it in the most impossibly embarrassing and amazing way. And so, dear Claire, <laughs> thank you for your forbearance and your charity in permitting me to come to Emerson. Thank you. I commend Jackie and the trustees on Emerson's effort to build a comprehensive center in Hollywood that will enhance academic program for Emerson students, for undergraduates, graduates, and professional studies students, and create spaces that will integrate living and learning as well as enhance the alumni ties to Emerson. It represents a bold visual statement of Emerson's presence in LA, which includes, as you know, several thousand alumni and alumni active in the media and entertainment industries, many of whom are well known. Arts Emerson, Arts Emerson the world on stage, will not only advance the educational ambitions of Emerson faculty and students, it will also refresh and invigorate a new performing arts era in Boston and beyond through the diversity and depth of its professional theatrical productions from around the world on this stage and the stage at Paramount and other venues. So I inherit a wonderful platform on which to begin a new job. And while we have all learned the inherent danger of a president-elect making too many bold promises before he or she has even assumed office. I would like to offer a few tentative ideas of what the future might hold for us working together, acknowledging that these ideas perforce suffer from the lack of sharpness that debate and discussion with faculty and students and alumni and alumni and staff and trustees would lend to them the helpful discourse of sharp, of shared governance that transforms good or interesting thoughts into excellent ideas. Emerson's mission is to educate the people who will solve the problems and change the world 
through engaged leadership in communication and the arts. A mission informed by liberal learning, recognizing that the world is still in want of clear-headed citizens, tempered by historical perspective, disciplined by rational thinking and moral compass, who speak well and write plainly and with hearts warmed to the transforming power of virtue and beauty, no matter their profession or their discipline. Communication, marketing, journalism, communication sciences and disorders, vis visual and media arts, the performing arts, writing, literature and publishing represent the disciplines and materials out of which Emerson graduates will create ideas that will make of this old world a new world. Bertrand Russell reminds us, he said that humankind fears thought as it fears nothing else on earth, more than ruin, more even than death. Thought is subversive and revolutionary, destructive and terrible. Thought is merciless to privilege, established institutions and comfortable habit. Thought is great and swift and free, the light of the world. A good idea may lead to the creation and manufacture of a silicon wafer, but the great mind, the truly great mind, imagines technology and communication as solutions to fundamental human problems and the arts to that which connects us to enduring human values. In the years ahead, we must invest in Emerson's core, beginning with the people and programs that bring it to life. Emerson is a student-centered place of learning, rightly so, but the faculty represent the heart of its academic enterprise. Emerson demands much of its faculty. It takes a very special person to teach at Emerson. They shape what we teach and how it is to be taught. And we must ensure within the paradigm of shared governance that faculty have the support, the recognition, the reward they need in order to teach well, to advance their research and creative projects, advise students, and to be good citizens in the Emerson community. But we must also invest in our students and seek to enhance their edu educational experiences both in and outside of the classroom. Because education does not stop at the classroom door or when they leave Emerson's glorious creative laboratories and clini clinical spaces, but rather it extends profoundly into the co-curricular life that they lead. And we need to make sure that Emerson's curriculum and the architecture of their social lives are organized so as to contribute meaningfully to their growth and development, so as to put into play the fullness of their potential as leaders and shapers of society through communication and the arts. Because we want them to leave Emerson with the sure knowledge that they were educated not to extract value, but to add value to human society. We must invest in the staff and administrators whose work enhances academic excellence. They are equally co committed to ensuring that Emerson provides its students with a great educational experience. They support the faculty in countless ways on a daily basis and their important work, whether in facilities or admissions or housing or fundraising or athletics, to name only a few, tells a remarkable story about a remarkable college. We must invest in diversity and take advantage of the increasing globalism of contemporary life. In 1916, John Dewey described democracy as the most ethical aspiration created by ethical communities. This aspiration was unattainable, he wrote, without a society's commitment to lifelong education to develop the capacities of associated living in a society characterized by diversity and complexity. The different points of view that emerge from diverse cultural heritages and ethnic backgrounds enlarge our aesthetic horizons. They enrich our intellectual discourse 
and sharpen our cultural perspectives and give increased focus to who we are and what we stand for as a nation. The very best students want to study at colleges and universities where diversity is represented in several dimensions and where there are plentiful opportunities to live and study in academic environments beyond American borders. We must invest in programs that drive innovation and cre create new strategic alliances and partnerships, not only here but abroad, that will leverage resources to further Emerson's evolution as one of the nation's leading institutions of higher learning in its specialized fields. Emerson occupies a prominent position in the middle of what I call this techno-cultural revolution taking place around us, and it has the opportunity, even the obligation, some might say, with its committed faculty, terrific students, and first-class facilities to not only prepare its graduates for significant professional work, but also develop the pioneering, the daring, the original ideas that will transform communication and arts into the future. And finally, we must invest in the community itself by identifying and creating communal spaces that contribute to good conversation, to the sharing of important ideas, and to building trust and comity. For Emerson is an intellectual community, a commonwealth of learning, not merely a congregation of individuals devoted to self-cultivation alone. The faculty especially need informal gathering spaces that enable discussions about interdisciplinarity, excellence in teaching, joint research and creative projects, curricular innovation, spaces that build friendships and allow faculty to step outside of their programs and departments into the bright light of an intellectual community working towards common ends. And as we begin the thoughtful transition of leadership, we are reminded of the importance of legacy and the powerful lessons of history. We have all arrived at this wonderful moment together because of countless gestures of hope made by the generations that preceded us. The baby born, the family begun, the college founded, the care and nurturing of our schools, our communities, a wonderful variety of faiths and of course our families and their families before them. There is a Vietnamese proverb that says, when eating fruit, remember who planted the tree. When drinking clear water, remember who dug the well. So let us remain true to the authenticity of Emerson's mission, a mission that has nurtured its steady progress to a place of distinction and excellence, while at the same time we forge new paths of inquiry and discover new academic opportunities. Let us raise the bar high and seek the most noble of our aspirations with common purpose and common hope. Let us be common, let us be cutting edge, let us occupy with confidence those intellectual liminal spaces that liberate us from the confinement of our narrow rooms of thought. Let us be dynamic and forward-thinking, not only distinctive, but distinguished, not only excellent, but extraordinary. For the history of Emerson College instructs us, as we have seen in Jackie's brilliant leadership and those who came before her, that when this great college meets its challenges head-on with vision and courage and hope and integrity, it will flourish beyond measure. Now, trust is a thing earned, and I plan to earn it by being honest and accessible and open and respectful of diverse points of view. There is something truly great, truly exciting, truly special, truly wonderful, something, dare I say it, there's something really cool happening at Emerson. And I am very thankful that the trustees have placed their faith in the promise of my leadership. Thank you for being here today and listening to my words. 
good cheer, and I look forward to seeing you in the fall of next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Two great presidents, thank you very, very much for being here. Thanks again to the uh, search committee that did an extraordinary job. And if uh, I might, speaking for the Emerson community, I want to make sure no one thinks I'm a Visigoth, both presidents quoting liberally from poets. Let me go to Elizabeth Barrett Browning <laughs> as I close. And on behalf of the Emerson community, plead, stay with me, stay with me the best is yet to be. Have a great day.